psychotherapy community. And today I'm going to be sharing some of the different ways we can capitalize on our younger clients and on their families innate natural propensity to change. They're going to grow, they're going to develop. We know when kids come to our sessions, they often don't want to be there. Somebody else has suggested that they should be either in therapy, be it a teacher or a parent, or there's a family dynamic that's a problem. Often our younger clients say that it's not themselves, but somebody else. So the buy-in, how do we help our younger clients to want to be in the session? That starts from the moment you come into the room. It's part of that foundation of sensory motor psychotherapy principles with the expectation that there's going to be change. We're going to collaborate with our clients and help them, collaboratively working together, establishing goals, finding ways to shift what's going on in the body, to check out, to name. Of course, psychoeducation is so fundamental. Being able to help our clients to understand that there is a mind-body correlation. So today's interdisciplinary approach to looking at sensory motor psychotherapy and our younger clients and their families taking that fundamental principle that our clients are going to come into our office and we want to help them want to be there. So the buy-in starts with the office itself, the environment. And if you have the ability to have a few offices from which they can choose, as we have in our clinic in Los Angeles, we have one office that's light and bright and windows. We call it the beach house without the beach. And then another office that kids will call the cave. It's dark, it has very little light. It's much more narrow, colorful, but narrow and quiet. And some of those people who are in that room experience it like a cocoon. And we want to help them. We know that we want to help their bodies to feel safe. So giving them a choice, which office do they want to work in and having variety of offices with a variety of choices. And then asking them where they want to sit. We do that with all our sensory motor psychotherapy clients, but with our younger children, we have more options beanbag chairs, rugs that are cozy and comfy and tactile. If they sit on the floor, we'll sit on the floor. With one of our littlest clients that we've taped for the sensory motor community, we call her Ginger. She immediately slid down to the floor. And as mom was in the room watching, she's three and a half, mom wanted to continue the dialogue. So very gently, I took my hand and I said, hold on a second, mom. I wanna hear what you have to say, but look what's happening with Ginger's feet. And indeed her feet were moving and they found themselves tapping against the couch, tapping against a drum box. We have drums in all of our offices. And as they tapped against the drum box, we were able to go right with what was happening in the room in the moment. And indeed I did come back to mom and some of the things she wanted to say, but only after we had this beautiful, sensory motor psychotherapy intervention, where mom started to look at what Ginger's body was telling us. Indeed, her body, her feet, had a message that mom had not known about, even though it was right before her. Her feet, Ginger's feet, were always crawling up upon her dad, crawling against the wall, that moving back and forth. And so we were able to capitalize on something that was happening right in her body. And this was very early in the session, in the first handful of minutes, quieting the family members to be observant, to be curious, to be open, and starting the dialogue in the room with the children or with the family about what's happening inside our body. A question for Ginger is, I noticed your feet were moving, they were tapping. And then she started tapping more. So we said, let's look at that. So we're going right to framing as we know, in our community, level one, we speak about framing as a way of working with our kids. We're asking, we're collaborating. Hey, can we look at that? And then she tapped a little more. And at this very young age, where we know that her language was limited, she was able to become part of a dialogue that then led us to another 
way of working. We can come back to gingers. We probably will in each of these four different opportunities to come together. But let's go back to what's in the room. As I mentioned, when that family came in, instead of my having my therapist chair, I said, where would you like to sit? And the mom said, where do you sit? And I said, wherever you are not. So then Ginger led the way. And as she sat down on the rug, as she made herself at home, you could see a part of her saw it was an invitation to play. And we know Yak Panksaf so speaks so magnificently. He spoke about working with our kids and bringing in play. That is so critical for our sensory motor clients, letting them know that our session is one where they get to play with us, that we will follow their lead and letting the family know that play is a way of understanding, of dropping beneath the words, especially if there is a nonverbal component, there are challenges with words or kids say they don't want to use their words, or kids say that they don't want to be in therapy. I'm sure some of us have had clients who say, all right, I'm here. You can see their hands crossed over themselves, but I'm not going to say a word. And I go right with that. And I say, let's see what we can say without words. I might take one of the drums. We have many drums in our offices and say, hey, without words, why don't you let us know? Just perhaps tap onto the drum and let us know what you might hope to get out of therapy, or why you don't wanna be here, or what's wrong with mom and dad that they think you need to be here. And as soon as that drumming happens, it's an invitation to a dialogue. I might take a drum and say to mom or dad or the caregiver in the room, why don't you tap back? Let us know in your own words. I might ask, well, if those hands could have language, what would they say? Or if your hands could speak, what would they say? Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But again, it's an invitation that we're doing something very different here than they might have experienced in a past therapy session or in their family dynamic. When we look at the room, always we're asking for what they might want, how they might wanna be. And in that welcoming environment, it's one of the paradigms that we look at as we approach family treatment. We're asking them, we're following them, we're always going back to them. The frame will change quite rapidly, far more rapidly than in my work with my individual adult clients. The frame changes because we're following our kids. I think two and a half to three minutes is the average attention span for some of our preschool kids. And it's not much more than that for some of our other kids, especially when trauma is affecting the brain, when that prefrontal cortex that could engage shuts down because of the dialogue, because I'm a stranger. So many kids will say, either verbally or non-verbally through their body language, I don't wanna be here. So we find ways to invite them to be there. I might jump onto one of our beanbag chairs and say, you're welcome to sit here or on one of the big exercise balls. We have large exercise balls. Say, I wonder what would happen if you sit here. With the beanbag chair, it gives them the cozy sense of containment. With the balls, they can bounce. Kids love to bounce, kids love to play. And as they sit on the ball, sometimes the littlest of kids will take the large ball, at which point I'll support them or have a parent do that. Other times they'll choose a teeny tiny ball. All of these, are indicators which we can follow because indeed we're being curious. We're wanting to know what they experience. All of our rooms have some sort of mobility. One of our rooms, the one I'm teaching from today, and I'm gonna turn the camera for a second. You'll see there's our swing. We have swings, even as you look at some of the other things, there's a tree behind that hangs a dream catcher, lots of, child-friendly ways of inviting a dialogue, but the swings are one of the best ways to engage. I remember one of our LA trainings, um, Pat Ogden and I were part of a community where one of our level one students was pregnant. And so at one point in the work, Pat put her hands gently on this mother-to-be and started rocking her. 
and the mother self-soothed and you can watch her. This is one of our colleagues who may be listening right now. She very calmly said, this feels so nurturing, so containing. And that's what we try to do with our kids. Give them that movement, that experience. So if you were to ask one thing you could do to change your offices, have access to swings, have offices with swings in the room or some other mobility that allows for the containment. That's why I showed you this swing where the arms can contain. In fact, on top, you're able to close it so that it becomes a true cocoon. And yet that movement seems to calm, self-regulate and invite our clients in to be able to be present or hammocks. Hammocks are fabulous ways or rocking chairs for ourselves as well. From Ikea, I've had a chair that I've had for a couple of decades now. It has the ever so slight ability to rock back and forth, but that rocking soothes me. Clients in rocking chairs or even in chairs with mobility can self-soothe as the environment gets more tense. I'm thinking of one family where they went from zero to 16 arousal. I'm sure some of you have had that experience. And one of the ways to mitigate is to change their body position. Say, hey, let's try something. Can we try a trick? I have a trick and kids love tricks. And I'll say, why don't you sit here and I'll move them into a moving object chair swing. Let's see if just by changing the position we're in, our body can start to self-regulate. And invariably something will shift. It gives that milla moment for this part of the brain to catch up, for the body to catch up, and for the calmness that is so important so that we can start communication process, ourselves and our clients, between our clients and their family members, in the environment. So often at school, there's no mobility. Imagine if they had a resource of being able to stand on their tippy toes while seated in the chair. Perhaps try it, all of you who are listening now. Push your tiptoes right into the floor. As I do it, I see my body become aligned, very much a sensory motor principle, but it also allows for the energy, especially the agitation or anxiety or frustration or anger to go into the floor. I might say to our clients, push, push, push really hard with your feet, ever so slightly so that nobody can see. And it becomes that exercise of teeny tiny movements. And that changes the entire organization of experience. And then we can say, shall we frame that? Shall we notice what happens as you sit taller, as your head becomes more aligned? We can ask them to reach with their head all the way to the ceiling so that they can feel the alignment from the top of their head down through their feet and to their body. And the beauty of this exercise, this alignment allows for a power to come through their body, strength. But often I'm asking that by saying, what do you notice changes? If they say, I don't know, I might give them a menu. Let's say they say, I feel more powerful. Where do you notice it in your body? And with kids, they often need guidance and they need that the, the recognition that comes. They may not be able to recall the words, but if you say, are you feeling powerful or potent or taller or bigger or stronger, the recognition allows them to acknowledge, to pick one. Also, as we're working with them, the color in the room can allow them to start to learn about colors such as red for emotion. And I'll use an analogy of red as a traffic light. Green, we're feeling good. We can continue. We can go. We can engage. We're starting to get yellow, a little more anxious. And when we hit red, or when that part of the prefrontal cortex goes pop, when we stop being present in the room, often kids are able to say, I'm feeling red, which allows us to know and help them stay within that window. We can explain the window of tolerance. In some of the articles that I've written um, for sensory motor psychotherapy, we've spoken about applying the window of tolerance for our younger kids using recognition and also pictures and images 
basset hounds is one of the drawings that I'll give them where we have a little puppy dog. When he's lying flat, they might say, that's me. That dissociative quality or that drop in the dorsal vagal, that experience of what? What was I talking about? I can use that as a moment to help them understand what's going on in their body. And as we look at props, which we will in each of these webinars, we're able to come up with different ways. I'll bring a picture next time of the basset hounds, but they're able to, with the magnetic field, identify this is what I'm feeling, or this is where I'm feeling. They can sometimes recognize one of the pictures and feel that way. So with some of these ideas that I've given you now, you can take them back if you're in one of the trainings. I know that in Los Angeles, Mason Somers and Rebecca Farka are um, consistently working with our level two students, weaving in the principles that they're learning to not just to our own as learners, as therapists, not only our own childhood experiences, but applying it to the experiences of children that they're working with. If you are a parent, you're an expert at child. But if you work with kids, you can easily apply the level two theories and ideas and readings, understanding our own character to the clients that come in. And I'm hoping as we continue this series that each one of you will be able to try these out. If there's somebody in your life right now that you wanna practice with using some of the ideas that we came up with today and knowing that it's all play as we help our children and our families shift their sensation, shift their emotion, their posture, their movement. We'll go into this much more next time when we meet again in two weeks as our goal then is to look at the state that comes from feeling the comfort. So today focus so much on making contact with our clients, creating an environment and our next level of work together We'll be helping them understand shape, state shifts and that posture and movement and bringing it into case studies. So I started with Ginger and we'll come with one final story about her. We learned that when she pushes with her feet, it helped break a cycle, the cycle that she came in for. She was referred because of trichotillomania, the hair pulling that she would do with her hands to calm herself. Instead, she found a new resource with her feet through her body and by pushing against a ball at home when she fell asleep at night, they had a ball at the end of her bed that was attached on an exercise ball. She could kick herself to sleep and in the car when she would drive, kicking against the ball helped her to regulate, helped her to calm, all known to us because we followed her and helped her find the meaning that was coming from her feet and find the resource. So thank you so much. Today was a great beginning and looking forward to seeing all of you in the coming weeks. Bye-bye.